Hello, this is me starting another video. Hi. People like that. They like it when you say hello to them, even though I can't see you. Hello out there. I learned that was a child. It was what this thing called the romper room, and she'd hold up a fake mirror and go, Hello, everyone out there. Like, that's kind of magic. A mirror that you actually look through. So she's not seeing herself. She's seeing you. She's seeing you while she's seeing herself. She sees you in her own body. Think about holding up a, a mirrorless mirror to children. Hello, Bobby and Jane and Joe. Are you having fun at play today? Inside my body? As I take you on like your mother's body and keep you out of your mother's way for a half an hour or so? It's very feminine, isn't it? You have this feminine white woman, you know, singing these songs, you know? Right? To me, the, the sickening thing about Judy Garland in The Wizard of Oz is she's too feminine. She's too cheerful. She's too unconcerned that in the last 20 minutes of her life, you know, there's been a, a cataclysmic tornado. She's in another world. And the first thing that happens is someone is murdered, just like in the fucking Bible. Next thing you know, there's fucking flying monkeys and men with no hearts, no brains and no dicks walking beside her, hoping to find the lucky fucking cherry at the top of the rainbow. You know? Actually, the one thing they're not is impotent. What do you think men with no hearts and no courage and no fucking brains end up doing when they're with girls like Judy Garland? They're behind a tree, fucking her. That's what they're doing. They're like the three fucking wise men. Right? The, the Beto is the one thing they haven't lost. That would be, if I, my daughter was walking on fucking Golden Road after she's gone into some other fucking dimension, which indicates intoxication and delusion or trauma. When someone goes into a fantasy world, that's an indication that they've been sexually abused, just like Alice in Wonderland. Right? It's a drug-induced, right? And people who've been sexually abused often use drugs and alcohol and induce different states of mind. There, I don't know the knowledge behind this, but there's part of the psychosis that the mind has to go into to sustain trauma uh, makes it desirable for them to intoxicate their mind and dislocate it and lower their inhibitions. Right? Again, I'm not the knower of such things, but that, that would be something to look into. I'd have to spend more time thinking. I have, actually, but I didn't. Like, psychosis is like a language. It's like a different set of rules for the brain. And if you know them, you can kind of de-engineer how certain people behave. And then you could see how almost everyone is psychotic every day. You have to be psychotic to drive a car. Not because it's bad, but because your brain can't continue to function higher than two miles per hour in the way that it normally does. That's why I prefer walking. I can think better. I can't think when I drive. <laughs> well, I mean, you can think more than when you're driving than when you're in the passenger seat because at least you've got something to do to keep your brain working. Ew, go cars. Oh, shit. Yes, okay. That was an ant. I think it was just a drop of sweat from my backity backity boot. No ice. That's okay. Oh, chicka boom, ba doom, ba chicka boom, 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 chicka boom, ba day. Uh, doom, ba chicka boom, ba doom, ba chicka boom, ba da boom, ba chicka boom, ba day. She's too feminine, right? That's, you know what I mean? She's too feminine. Like, I can't stand women who are too feminine because excess femininity is also a response to sexual abuse. It's like saying the yellow brick road, which is basically the money of the Federal Reserve and all this sort of stuff, right? Is paid with the sexual abuse of children by strange men with no hearts or brains or courage. What is it? Like they, they lack like three different things. The tin man lacks a heart. The lion lacks courage, which is strange because that's a heart. And the scarecrow doesn't have a brain, presumably because it's made of straw, but so would his heart be. So they're all three of them brainless and heartless. In fact, the lion is one when it maybe has a bit of brains in him. Why did the author choose to make the lion so scared? <coughs> Do you think? 
why is the man made of tannin? Why does Dorothy have to oil him before he starts moving again? Now, Tin Man is not a robot, <coughs> so presumably he doesn't really have anything inside of him either. <coughs> it's made of the stuff of her life. Tin from the farm, straw, a lion, maybe a stuffed animal. Is it an expression of her? We don't really know for sure. What about the flying monkeys? Is that like the libido? Right? Flight again takes you out of your body. It takes you into another realm. Monkeys that fly take the child, like well from, but these monkeys, their flight darkens the sun. In a world of magic, presumably, there's evil. It's a monkey and it flies, right? It's a place that children usually maybe fantasize about the clouds or, you know, fairies or whatever. Now it's like libidinous horny monkeys in your abstract brain function. It's like the growth of the libido, right? She's going through some sort of sexual initiation, some sexual becoming, a storm. It's taken away from her family, Toto, the tutu of the libido of God. Now, these three men, presumably, you know, are the least libidinous males you could imagine. Hi there, I'm the Tin Man. I'm like Data. Hi, I'm the Scarecrow, and I'm too stupid to fuck anyone. I'm just there to, to scare crows away. And then the lion, oh, I'm too scared to ever want to touch a booby. What happens, what's the other side of these personalities? If we all have some other, what's the other side? There's a scarecrow on some level. How, how, how would the libido help all of these people? How could they suddenly, whether they're smart, whether they're, they have a, a heart, or brain, or any real courage, they're just scared little children themselves, what would help them, give them courage? The libido. Alcohol, liquid courage. The libido is like the language of liquid courage. It speaks, it has a kind of currency to it. Mmm. Right? To get turned on is to be attracted. Right? An orgasm is an electrical discharge. To build up a charge, there has to be some kind of irritation, some kind of conflict, some kind of resistance, right? And, you know, dating, from dating to coitus, you're looking at the breaking down of resistance. Call it love, call it rape, you break down the resistance, the people are breaking down resistance to each other. Mm -hmm. The first time people meet, one person might disarm the other. So I find that sexual predators can advance a great amount of disarming conversation with me and get me to be more familiar with anyone that I would want to be, okay? And I could let that go. What nauseates me is people or young men who would think that that's actually a reasonable way to meet somebody. But isn't that what libido teaches people? To get out and meet someone? Hey there, how you doing, Charlie? Hmm? And people don't like that I'm not overly friendly, but I think other people appreciate that I'm just more natural. I don't pretend to like people. I don't pretend to hate people. I don't presume to threat, but I'm just not like... Sometimes I think people are just nervous because they're waiting for me to start telling them what role to play. You know, you could just sit there staring forever and go, okay, so it's a good day out there, isn't it? Hey, what do you say, sports fans? Could I have a coffee? Make it a tall latte. Put some almond milk on that and put some stink on it. A little chocolate, what do you say? A little sugar, sugar. <laughs> Thank you so much. Now, if you bring the libidinous person in there, <laughs> have a good day, sir. Oh, here's five bucks for you. Get yourself uh, some new hair plugs. What do you say? <laughs> and I watch people, men, women in public, you know, being gregarious and loving, maybe, or whatever. You know, I just 
when you see women, like a group of women, and only one of them is talking, or a couple, and only the woman is talking, and like, how often is it just completely useless? Time filler. Like you just, and I've seen men like this too, who just get off on hearing the sound of their own voice. They're the, when there's a pack of monkeys, they're the only ones talking. You know? You could bring any 10 women together, say, okay, who's the leader here? Who wants to do all the talking? Oh, that's Nancy. <laughs> Oh, how did you all know? Well, you always do all the talking. Well, I don't know if I'm fit to be the only one who talks, but uh, sure, okay. I think it's kind of my destiny. What can I do for you? <laughs> you don't really find the leader in the group. You just find the most libidinous, sometimes the most needy, the one who's just the loudest. And then it's like, there's the one who really knows what's going on, you know? But once the first person a group sends me, if you will, is some libidinous, you know, schmuck, I don't really want to meet anyone else. Even if the rest of you are angels. Because the combination of all of you is not, doesn't make one good person. People say there's good cops and bad cops, but the combination of all cops is organizational. And you can actually, at this point, compare them to all people, not really just the police. It's organizational. Humans doing almost anything, good or bad, through groups and industries and jobs, are organizational. We, we ask them to do that. We're saying you have to be organizational person. That's it. You know? And organizational, organizational people have dislocated egos. Everyone does which means they can be possessed by the wrong idea. Just being misinformed or possessed or a tendency towards bias. Like, you know, maybe black arrests are a bit higher for these people. And it's like, it's organizational as much as anything else. It's circumstantial, it's organizational. Like, no matter what you do in society, there's going to be trends. And it's not always going to be perfect. And you can spend your life hacking away at everything retarded about each of us, which is basically what I do. And then look at the organizational level, which would be like, you know, kind of like me developing a neocortex, like a crow magnon developing a neocortex. Like, oh, it's organizational. Yeah. Not exactly Ayn Rand, not exactly the foundation of Isaac Asimov, but not exactly total recall, but a little bit of each of these things. You know, in a more practical way, but also very magical. I mean, how would you control the world? How would you manage it? Right? Manage itself means man's torture. <laughs> yeah. It's right there in the language, you know? Our pain manages us. You know, we want to manage our pain, and our pain manages us. You know? <laughs> and other people's pain manages us. And then we manage with that, and then people manage with us, and we're like, humans are now just one giant bureaucratic pathological management system. We're all managing everything, we're being managed. We scarcely get to be real people. I'm not saying, like, down with the world. I'm saying, like, maybe in the future, you can have recreational green zones for people to kind of go native. You know, you don't have to commit crimes. You don't have to, like, hunt people. You don't get to break laws. You just get to be like Landon. You get to be like rain. We'll call it, like, a be like rain reserve. And you do, like, all kinds of awesome shit. No matter what, you know, you'd be out. You get, like, 10,000 acres to yourself for, like, seven years. You got little cabins fully stocked with whatever you want for you and your children. And the, the idea is just to see what kind of culture and religion, what kind of happiness and health you could, you could achieve and, and, and bring to the whole world. You, would be, you wouldn't be studied because you could be relied upon to offer useful information to anyone respectful enough who'd have to be specially trained to interact with you in certain sacred places of your designation for you to present information or data or whatever you'd like. And maybe they could send people in to interact with you. And instead of healing them like some gurus, you'd be like, so that was a sick fuck. Can you give us another one? <laughs> hey, uh, here they are. We bring them back to the gate. Um, yeah, that's a sick fuck. Uh, can you send us another one? <laughs> yeah, okay, let's let, we'll make this clear. All you are sick fucks. <laughs> Stop coming to our compound, okay? Let's <laughs> Because you would just, if you had all that time, everyone would be like a sick fuck to you. I would come to your compound. It's like, oh, wow, it's Rain Griffin. At least somebody that's cool. And you'd be like, I'd be there for a few hours. You'd be like, Rain, what? You're a sick fuck. <laughs> what? Come on. I invented this idea. I know. You're a sick fuck. This is sick, dude. 
You shouldn't make some people so happy while others suffer so much. You're torturing us. We've become so empathetic, we can never be happy again. <laughs> I'm sorry. That is one of the side effects. <laughs> How can we just cut ourselves off from the suffering of humanity? How do we do it? <laughs> Is that like Jerry Seinfeld? Well, it's hard. You gotta be like a child, think like a man, but have the greatness of a woman to, and a good tan. And then you also need to make up enigmatic phrases on your lips that you could hypo hypothesize to yourself that you could say to the world under various alluring circumstances conjured up by your use of mere words and the wind through your divine lips and offer them various choices as to retaining, improving, or restoring the discriminating power of their own higher abstract faculties. Wow. <laughs> yeah, like I said, Rain, you're fucked. <laughs> All right, okay, well, there you go then. I'll leave you to it. <laughs> by the way, while I'm still here, can I, can I ask you a few questions? Yeah. Um, What's the well for? <laughs> I noticed that it doesn't have any water in it. Oh yeah, we use that to shit in it. Just we put it all in one place, you know. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay, no problem. Okay, right, that explains all the flies. <laughs> you have a problem with that? Hmm? You sick fuck? It's like, what do you do with your crap? Leave it everywhere for someone to find? No, not exactly. It's not like Easter. <laughs> hey guys, I've spent many years out in the woods here. It's time for us to have a Rain Griffin annual Easter egg hunt. <laughs> if you find something brown and mushy, you win. <laughs> mushy, mushy. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's gone back to poop. But it always does, really, in my world. It all comes back to poop. And then I just breathe a sigh. It's back to poop again. I'm back, everyone. The man who talks about poop. I'm not that smart, illustrious thinker of all things mythological, poetic, philosophical, and yet random, so that my genius is scattered to the wind even as it comes from my divine lips, never to be seen or heard again. There it goes. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye, thoughts. Enjoy the earth. Your thoughts can never sue you for paternity or palimony. What an awful word. Palimony. Paul, right? A Paul. Palimony. Matrimony. Palimony. Alimony. These are not words I want to hear. <laughs> My scrotum's like, why are you talking that way? We all want to die. <laughs> it, like your, 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 the, your semen and its little inner earth universe is like, Master, the clouds and doom and darkness and our antidepressants aren't working anymore. It's okay, I'm sorry. I mean, never say the word palimony around your testicles. No man is ever masturbating going, wow, I mean, it would be really great and make this moment even hotter is if I was like paying alimony and palimony and matrimony and that I'd be able to be put in federal prison by this crazy bitch who I never fucking knew and made certain suggestions while she was sucking my dick on the first date that led to me to believe things that, believe it or not, are not true. <laughs> And I'm going to go to jail if I don't pay your money. It's like, woo, touchdown. <laughs> Women should be like high-fiving each other. I love the law. I love the law. <laughs> I become a judge myself working in divorce court. And she gets everything. <laughs> and she gets everything again. <laughs> pretty, moon, men, pretty soon men and the lawyers stay home and they just send in their testicles. Eh, and that, 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 that's probably what the gavel is for. It's probably called the testicle. You know, instead of having the testament, John Grisham should write, or Michael Crichton, the testicle. The vestibule of the testicle. The vesticle. I get my testicles and my reticles a little mixed up. It's a cross, really. It's a cross over my balls. When you put the reticle over a hypothetical testicle that warms my blood since I was born in my mother's womb and has a song which runs through all the rivers of the beautiful beat of her heart, not just through her body, but through time itself, which is all that has ever been true and beautiful in existence, and in the world before worlds where we lived unhurt and unafraid, the pure spirit of what you call God. 
and there is a language that can be spoken, and there are sounds which can be made, if we can make all this clamor to some good, which yet feel a deep and wondrous river from these roots of heaven itself coursing through our lips. And I would give anything to find the song of that knowledge. Anything. That's what I live my life in faith of. It's not so much something I have, I suppose, but you could call it a mission statement. There's something right about that since I was a child. There's something right about that. You've got to talk to hold on to heaven. This is a heaven-holding device. You want to hold heaven in your hands. You want to feel knowledge upon your lips. Mm. you got to go all the way back to heaven to the first time you had a more complicated thought of heaven than you had or were forced by various unseen forces to start having more complicated thoughts about pain or love or death or doom. Maybe some deep blue day before it dawns. That's something so fresh. Fresh as the beginning of your life could be born that very day when you were its minister, its first man. It's a great responsibility. Do you think you can handle it? I think you could. You don't ask for it, but it's like everything else in this world. It's yours. Poetry isn't just words. It's heaven when it slows down. You catch a bit of a sound of its song as it passes by. Because you can't catch up to heaven. But sometimes if you're slow enough, heaven catches up to you. Let heaven catch up to you, people. Let heaven catch up. Slow down, nature always seems to say. The fairies of the earth. Or if you ever had a chance to talk to people and tell them to stop trying to solve all these problems, that includes me. Stop trying to do things. Stop doing things. That's the problem. <laughs> do less. Slow down. Not in a crippled, I want to smoke crack all day kind of way, you know. But just, if you want to not do anything all day and feel like you've done something, do what I do. I go outside all day and smoke weed. I mean, if you stay inside doing anything, I don't know, unless you work at home, it's hard to feel like you've done something, you know. If you really want to slow down, it's nice to just spend some time outside. People walk their dogs, they feel like they've done something, you know? What did you do today, you know? Going outside is, is a hard thing to regret. You, know, you just need, I tell you from my, the bottom of my own subconscious, just the first breath of air, even if I get into the carport in the building, fresh air is always better than the indoor air. Always, always, always. Air is king. So just understand the first thing about going outside, that is the fucking air supply. Right? That's one. Why do you open a window? Why do you open your window in your car? You can tell everyone in your car, hey, worship the air supply, motherfuckers. You like that? That's fresh fucking air. That's the earth's fucking sacred language right from fucking heaven to you. What do you say about that? Everyone, woo! Air! Go air! <laughs> Love it! Woo! Why do you think they pump oxygen into a fucking casino? <laughs> it's like a drug. I know air is not the same as oxygen. See, air is like a joint. It's got like wonderfully dirty things inside of it. <laughs> it's got pollen. Imagine what your lungs inhale. It's, it's never, you know, what? It's full of stuff, especially in the summer. You're, you're, you're breathing, you're drinking, you're eating. <laughs> you ever wonder that stuff that like goes down the wrong hole in your throat? And the way that just stays at the bottom of your lungs or something? You know, I wonder what we'd find in there. Pennies, keys, bits of toast. Hey, chicka dick, boop, boop, chicka dick. Like, I am sweating. Like Richard Simmons, sweating to the oldies. Shout, shout, let it all out. These are the things that we talk about. Come on. I'm talking to you, come on, I'm talking to you now, shout, shout, let it all out, woo!
These are the things that the birds are about. Woo! Their song. Of heaven and earth. Their song. Woo hoo. Of heaven and earth. Now wind, rain, earth and your brain. Every hot and cold as it comes again. Woo! My Lord. Woo hoo. My own mother tongue. My Lord. A kingdom come, yes, my mind, my blood and my voice, and every fucking freedom that a man enjoys. Woohoo! I'm talking to you. Woohoo! The sun is so blue. Who shall, shall, mm, let it all out? Mm, these are the things that we talk about. Oh, come on. I'm talking to you, come on, I'm talking to you, uh, it's time to smoke the sacred pipe. If you're never sure if you have a drug addiction or you feel a little unwholesome about your daily pack of cigarettes, do what I always do, or at least friends of mine used to do, call it sacred. <laughs> Leave me alone, it's sacred, I'm smoking. A man making smoke is a personal thing. Farts, smoke. Any bodily fluids, especially of a projectile nature. Things that make our mind feel a little better than it otherwise would feel, people. You have your drugs. I know you do. You love your fucking sugar. I, I'm telling you, my own drugs as a child. Sugar, bread, pop. Woo! Yeah, baby. Who needs drugs when you got this? In the drawing of the three in Stephen King, he goes, the gunslinger. Don't worry if you don't understand this. I'm not trying to out pop culture you. It's just a fantasy book. This guy called the gunslinger goes back in time, goes to New York, finds Eddie or something who's like a drug addict or something. Turns out to be a pretty good guy. Kind of the moral being like uh, lots of really good people live inside drug addicts and murderers and stuff. You know, I'm okay with that. <laughs> you got to tell a story somehow, right? You got to break a few natural laws if you're going to make an omelet, right? <laughs> I'm, just like, I'm just being a little facetious today. I'm, just, I'm in the mood. <laughs> anyway... The gunslinger goes back. The gunslinger doesn't do drugs, and he drinks a Coke from, like, I don't know, 1980 or something. And he's like, who needs other drugs when you have this? And uh, if, you ever, if you haven't drank any sugar for a long time and you open a Coca-Cola, which I think has a truckload of fucking sugar, and something they've engineered at Area 51, it just sends it right to your brain immediately. <laughs> it's got volatile fucking sucrose going into your hippocampus, and it is amazing. It's like... You can sit anywhere in public. It's like masturbating in public and have a Coke. It's like, oh, if you only knew what this was doing to me. <laughs> I want to have a Coke in front of a police officer, you know. What do you say, officer? <laughs> it's like doing heroin on a legal basis. By the way, just let me say that in all my life, I would hope that at least once, I mean really, not on some fantasy level, and not because I want stalkers, but in some level, maybe did something helpful to another being. Right? Not that I need to know, you know, whatever, right? Don't need to know, maybe don't want to know, but let's maybe say, just hypothetically, I actually helped another human being. The Canadian police officer is the only man I've known who's ever done that. Okay, so when anyone does me a solid, and you know, that counts for something, in a way that probably saved my life, so that's pretty good. I'll say that. You know, and, and it's like, it wasn't like he was my best friend or anything. He's just doing his job. So if doing their job can save my life, then uh, it can't be all bad. And um, they have a tough job. People like me often make it even harder than it needs to be. It's a sad fact. You know, I'm trying to... Uh, I don't know, have a better relationship with the world in seeking our principles and our development we uh, I sometimes piss people off I'm not perfect I try to be better you know it's a tough world for me sometimes and I know the police understand that you know they're pretty down to earth people around here. You know, just gotta, it takes time to earn people's respect, especially when you've lost it. 
they're pretty restrained in Canada. You know, I've never had a police interaction that didn't teach me something that was useful for life. You know, strangely enough. So <laughs> it's just they have a lot to teach. Or I have a lot to learn. One of the two. Um, other than that, you know, it's yeah, it's a big world out there. It has laws. We have need of them. Some people must uphold them or they would be useless. And their interpretation and application is not perfect. It can never satisfy everyone, and sometimes not even anyone. Conflict is like that. A lot of people leave, probably quite often in any kind of human conflict, totally unsatisfied. <laughs> and I think it's, it's possible to take that out on the police. It's not their job to make you satisfied about what a conflict has cost you. It's, if they did that, they would go insane. So. You know, I don't have to really see people's problems that often. I mean, I get touched by them as often as anybody, but I mean, I'm not spending my life being thrust into a kind of probe quality injection into various dire human conflicts. I don't, I, you know, I don't mind talking about God, God's asshole, no offense to police, but I don't want to actually be the probe that, that has to go in there and, and sort it all out. <laughs> no offense to police, I just, that's how I talk sometimes. <laughs> it's like, it's my religion about God, not about the police. You know, the, the worst things in the world to me happen in God's asshole. Like, they shouldn't happen. And so if we de-engineer where God's asshole is done by claiming it as like the universe of existence, I think we could figure out a lot of our problems. You know, maybe that's why I have problems with the police, because I think that way, but I don't know. <laughs> maybe that's a little complicated for the average working man. <laughs> so I try to just keep myself out of trouble. You know, <laughs> just, uh, you know don't, don't underrate the, uh, like, language is biological, right? It's about the brain, it's about the body. So language has to do everything our body does, everything our mind does, everything our blood does. Let's accept in a very earthy way that as people with high IQs and low IQs and high-mindedness and low-mindedness, we all eat and shit. And our language does as well. It, it has to do everything we want to do ourselves. And so through the agency of language and sounds and signals, we can feel, we can let the world do stuff for us. It's like the fetuses of all humans are telling the world to be the way it is. We're calling it forth with our own hungers. Our language, our minds have gone out across history and said, we want, we need, we want, we need, we want, we need. And all of a sudden it's like, well, not everyone can get what they need. Oh, then we need this, and we need that. And then it's like, well, you still can't get it. Well, now we need this, and now we need that, right? And that energy needs something to do to get what it needs, to guarantee it's going to get what it Not to send everyone out there as like, oh, well, you know, just see who can win. You know, there has to be rules. It's not that the earth has always been beset with such chaos, but modern life seems to have offered us that novelty, and it is an overwhelming thing to deal with in itself. Like all of civilization, all its complexities and doom is yet a novelty of the womb of civilization. It is not really the thing itself. It's a nightmare that some being called God is heaven in another realm called heaven where we don't fuck ourselves every day. You know what I mean? That's why God, Gandhi said civilization was a good idea. It's always a good idea how we want to arrange things, how we think they're arranged, you know? We want it to all be for the good. That's how nature is humans. I want the universe to be good. This woman in college said to me one day, like, do you think the universe is in its proper order? And I don't know if I was being funny or sarcastic or honest when I said, yeah, I think it is. <laughs> And it's weird because so much awful shit had happened to me, but I just, she, she asked it, and that's what I wanted to say. Yeah, yeah, okay, let's say it is. You know? She seemed to be okay with my response. She could have thought that I was a bit arrogant for saying so, but she asked, it's like, well, if you want an answer, I would say yes. Is the universe, you know, but you work at it to, to feel that way.
I, 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 you know, I don't mind TV so much in terms of like peace of mind or but I refuse to watch the news or anything to do with politics. I just, lots of other things too, but I mean, yeah, I just, uh, I, uh, I guess I watch very carefully what I get absorbed in. I notice like with Donald Trump, no offense, but a lot of people, and it's hard not to, I'm not saying it's wrong or stupid, but like you see how people get absorbed in such things as we do. Right. I'm sure people could look at me and say, well, you're pretty fucking absorbed and all kinds of things. But I'm just, from my perspective, it's like that's something that if I had a choice, which I did, I could really, I find that with Obama too. I, I liked him and all that. But I just, it was in a time in my life where I didn't even watch TV, so I didn't follow his elections. In fact, I avoided them. People in the House were watching a debate. I think it was him versus Hillary Clinton, whatever. And, um, you know, that's pretty historical, right? And my dad, I hadn't seen him in 20 years. And it's like, no, I'm not watching this. I came into the room and said to my dad and my brother, I said, you know this is all scripted, right? This is all a farce. And I left the room and studied the Bhagavad Gita, which is also a farce. Which, in fact, what's happening in the Bhagavad Gita, strangely enough, by this strange Indian translator in this Sanskrit language, was happening on the television. Isn't that amazing? In the literary world, we call that ironic. Um, in my world, I call that horrible and horrifying. <laughs> because what does it tell you about the world? <laughs> it's, like, it's like, think about that. Like, how does anyone claim the moral high ground? <laughs> you know? Um, we all masturbate. We all take a shit. You know? If that's not, if shit's not evil, I don't know what is. I mean, I don't know if I want to be around your shit. And you don't want to smell my shit. And that's like, we're agreed. If we were setting up some, like, alpha base somewhere on some planet, like, okay, what do you want to agree to first? Uh, okay, we got food, we got water, and um, what are we going to do about shitting? I say, you go into that sand dune, and I'll go the opposite direction in that sand dune, so that whatever happens, if we do run into someone's shit, it's our own. What do you say? Sounds good, man. <laughs> I like the way you think. Yes. Well, I hope everything we do is that easy. <laughs> What do we do with the women? Mm, I don't know. They haven't woken up yet from the space capsule. It says in the manual that we should delicately fondle their labias. <laughs> I think our governments wanted us to start a new colony right from the get-go. <laughs> no, I'm not doing that. That's, that's, uh, well, they are our wives. I know, but it's like, you want to trade? No, <laughs> no, I don't, but your wife is so cute. <laughs> no. <laughs> She kind of looks like a Raggedy Ann and Andy doll combined. A little androgynous, but also very soft. <laughs> Look, stop talking. We think we need another rule. <laughs> we don't talk about the women. According to this, we can let them sleep for another 13 days. I say we go for a hike and see what life is like without them. <laughs> the only danger being that we might not want to wake them up. That's uh, agreed. Let's go. Let's go find tools and shit. We can reenact Space Odyssey. We can both come to an, a different side of the river and start throwing shit at each other. <laughs> and then we'll wait for their high-pitched voices like the monolith when they wake and we're not around. Henry! It's like, shit, it's the monolith. We all have to get really dense and leaden, cover the sun, called Jupiter or Saturn, which is like the act of an actor. Right? What's happening to Jupiter or Saturn or the sun in Space Odyssey happens to the human subconscious in becoming in the actor. The sun is covered up and a new song emerges from the Borg libido. And the universe now becomes universe organized by this sun covering realm of acting. The Apollo of the stage. The actor is that which is born when something else is dead. The actor is that which is born when something else is dead. This is also something that can only be achieved in the human subconscious using a language that's actually a corruption of, but it's exploiting the energy of hot and cold, winter and summer, death and rebirth. So you see, like in Jesus, you could say, oh, that's a natural religion. You know, it's the crops dying, it's spring coming back. But like, when did you start killing a dude? You know? So this is how you can kind of use a discriminating power on Western religion or civilization. It's like, there is a kind of spring and a new life. There is a death that maybe is a pall to existence. But the day isn't necessarily divided by the night, and the, day, and the night does not necessarily destroy the day. 
in the way that nature is not about sex and competition, it's not all about death either. That it, it's, not, it's not a morbid condition that we have to imitate the language of nothing but a morbid condition and continue to think we, we're accessing a natural language or even our own subconscious in a way that is for our best interest. Although this type of dynamic often seems to our best interest because it's in the best interest of the forces and ideas or gods that rule the world and quite often our own behavior. You think about how humans are trained by bells and buzzers, which is a sound. And then all these other languages that are sound forth by the buzzer. So essentially, all of schooling is just a buzzer. And the end of the buzzer at the game has the greatest claim upon your subconscious. Everything that happens at the buzzer. Look at what Jordan did at the buzzer. Look at what this guy did at the buzzer. Look at everything that happens in the buzzer. Right? And that just get, dips right into your subconscious. <laughs> goes right into anything that was prying into your mind before you were born. And that's what God's magic is about. <laughs> Death that doesn't like necessarily kill you, but like gets in deep into the vulnerabilities inherent in a language of winter and spring. Where things come back to life, it doesn't mean that they were dead. Although plenty of things die in nature, and then plenty of things like the grass can come back to life. But it is not for us to imitate this literally by taking it as a condition of such a natural, if prodigious type of language that our lives can be justified in being so excessively morbid. Like, Western civilization lived in an endless winter. Why do you think we have the myth of the nuclear winter? The nuclear family is living in a nuclear winter. We're accessing the winter side, the moon side of human existence. And then we're dividing that into two. So the sun is completely, the summer is completely isolated. And we reproduce a new duality or a new biology in another schema. And this is exactly what you'd expect if we were living in a world where groups of us and the group subconscious, which is more powerful than your subconscious, and especially the more so that consciousness can be convinced by various types of repetitive sorts of signals that there's a war going on. And that's the end of that lesson for today. A lesson on things as they appear when my mind appears to do what it wants to. If my mind was like its own animal and my lips was its own animal and my instincts and the sounds and you could accuse me of being a schizophrenic or just like to listen to myself talk. I'm sure Jordan Peterson would say, this man just thinks he believes everything that comes out of his mouth is knowledge. I'm thinking like, well, how do you practice dancing? How do you do anything that's an art form? I don't see any judges sitting around me. I am, and those sometimes were free or free to go outside the bounds, which under whose constraints the sounds out of one's being can be taken to be more legitimate or credible or even explicable. Just someone dancing around the room going, this is my way, this is my poem, doesn't really make sense. But they're saying something. And maybe after a while, if they get satisfied talking and rambling around, they'll get around to saying something you can understand. And to me, that's not such a strange thing. Most things in our world are prepared for us, right? It's like a writer like me is supposed to say things and then, okay, I'll write that down and write that idea down. And what about that story? And here's a skit. And you'll see, I never, I talk about a lot of the same things, but I never say the same thing twice. It's not like I've got this memorized, but my mind has a familiar subjects that it likes to treat with. And yeah, you take, when I mean, you make choices, you always take risks. I could be following 99,000 blind alleys and that's the risk you take. I mean, I'm not going to say there's no risk. I'm not capable of being wrong. Right? And that's the difference between me and a narcissist. I like using my voice. I like what comes out of it. I, you never know. And I'm not writing it down, but I'm liking, I'm liking the things that are coming out of it. I mean, and if someone else does, great. If they don't, fine. I mean, that's, I like to add that caveat to my videos because I like to get going. And, and that's it. I mean, it's pretty innocuous, really. That, uh, and I'm more afraid than you would believe of, of often saying the wrong thing giving the impression of the wrong thing to the world around me. You know? That's why I speak very respectfully of the police. I feel like power comes with responsibility. If I could piss them off, which I have, it means I have power. So I have to think like, oh, they would probably say like, this guy needs to fucking grow up. So that's what I try to do. I try not to take it personally.
Because that's the one thing they're not, is personal. So, You know, if I don't have someone to show me the way, sometimes police have been like, because I didn't have a father to show me certain rules and boundaries. It doesn't mean like I'm an infant. It doesn't mean I'm not going to have my qualms about the boundaries around me. But if you can shove the world, you can shove back. And a man needs to learn that. you got to put yourself in... If you... Yeah, I mean, I have special needs. There are things that I just can't put up with. And so... I just, uh, I mean, I won't put up with them. I can't, you know, but I try, I try to take the load of the things I'm dealing with off so I can often just, you ever just feel like you're cleaning trauma out of your system, like your, your inbox, just so you can take in more? Like if, as soon as you clean it out, something else, that's how I feel. Like, so I kind of sometimes have to think of myself rather bitterly as nothing but a receptacle for other people's pain and trauma. I, I get a little angry. I think it, it's part of getting things out of my blood. You know, which and I thought to myself today, like nature was saying, well, Landon, you have a kind of a blessed life. You know, you have, you know, you have a bit of a dandy of a life. I mean, you have the luxury of being pissed off by things that other people don't really have the time to be pissed off by. And that's probably true. Um, that's probably true. Um, you have a lot of time to think about things and be sensitive. But a lot of being sensitive is just, to a lot of people, is just someone who, who behaves the way they do because they've had too much time to think. And it's just, there's nothing more clear to them than that. And there's certain ironies, certain facets to that, but that's that just tells you we live in a world with boundaries and other people. That's a good thing. You know? Hey, there's other people. Hey, they think differently. Hey, you can piss them off. What do you know? I mean, that's part of life. I have my own fears I have to deal with, my own paranoia, I guess, you know, about how people think of me. Which gives you some idea of the kinds of experiences I have. I mean, I have these experiences, but I also have the way I start to think about myself and you tell other people how to think about you and you have to say to yourself no matter what you like or think like what are you telling these people and how to treat you so if someone treats me badly I might be telling them unfortunately to treat me that way now I wouldn't say this to a victim I wouldn't say this to a woman I'm sure you would all show a lot of umbrage but I practice sometimes being able to, to also direct my criticism at myself in this way I think in a certain kind of safe sort of praxis, which is just an opportunity to use that word because Russell Brand used it one day and I thought it was cool. I have no idea what it means. And <laughs> I was trying to be as praxeable as possible. You know. uh, but anyway, if you have a safe kind of praxis with, in, in which to experiment with criticizing yourself, like, and I've watched women do this sometimes, crazy women, but sometimes women, women have had this ability, I'll say, that I usually don't, which is criticizing themselves, analyzing and going, you know, did I... Did I do something wrong in that situation? It's not always a good idea to do this. I'm not sure if like one could say like, oh yeah, that's a good thing to do. But I mean, I would say like, in what ways do I tell people to treat me the way they do? In what ways do I misinterpret what they're doing? In what ways and what reasons would I have for not reacting in proportion to what I'm interpreting and what I'm feeling and what exceptions I may be taking to what I might mistakenly think someone is saying to me. And you start, I mean, a lot of people would not say all those things to themselves. I'm guessing 99.9% .9 of men in North America will never have all of those thoughts about themselves on any given day. It's a pretty pussy thing to do. I mean, you know, no one, when you live in a world that's aggressive, you never want to even think in ways, unless you're just doing that to be safe, to be passive. Like, oh, okay, it's probably my fault. Sorry, sir, you know? That's okay. I mean, that's a good attitude, too. You walk in somewhere and you run into someone, sorry, like, my fault, my bad. Like, a lot of people would be very easily subdued if you just admit it's your fault right away. Right? Once you start saying, hey, you hit me, and they'd be like, hey, I hit you. And like, no, 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 I'm defending my fucking ground from the hitting I did not do. You know, it's like you ran into each other. It doesn't matter who says sorry. You can go on, right? And, uh, and so, in this way, we prepare for life's little grievances, you know, by being submissive, right? If you're in just a nice, quiet, little tank mode, you're like, something happens, like, Boo. oh, my bad. <laughs> oh, my bad. <laughs> How do you do, sir? Ooh. You pat them down, you steal their wallet. No. But isn't that what pickpocketers do in movies? They, they become submissive when they run into someone, and that person is disarmed by their submissive response to this prefigured contact, as though it's accidental. That's lying, right? A pretext to disarm you by summing up a conflict that is easily disarming if they respond in a submissive way. Now, if you hit me and I'm at a Starbucks and I'm just like, oh, sorry, 
even if it's not my fault, right? I'm going, eh, don't do it again. All right. <laughs> right? Who doesn't like that? All right, on, man. A latte and a pussy. This is great. <laughs> I'm going to drive my truck over them later. <laughs> you see how we think, right? Um, <coughs> so uh, I have to be able to live in a world that full of crazy people. You know? And if I, if I really think that, then I should get, over time, experimentally, I should get better at interacting with people. If I already know you're crazy, right? it's my fault if something happens. Because apparently, I'm smart enough to know you're all psychopaths. I should be properly prepared. <laughs> One, don't trust anyone. Check. Two, whatever happens, it's my fault. Check. Three, if it's not my fault and I take serious umbrage, do it myself later, away from everyone, just like masturbation. I take my pain the same place I would take any place where I would go masturbate. That's where I take all those things. <laughs> and, you know, some days I think it's like thunder clouds are above me. Other times it's like the clouds part and the power of my own righteous retribution makes the world a better place for everyone, even my enemies. <laughs> the scalar waves of my righteous sense of man's injustice to man resonates perfect peace at every organ of my being, which at this point is every organ of everyone's being. <laughs> and although I suffer from severe delusions of grandeur, it makes the world a better place. <laughs> I professor delusions of grandeur. <laughs> <coughs> or just nice things to think about yourself when you're stoned. You decide. Oh, God. And yet he's got another joint. What are we going to do? I'm trying to make this more exciting than it is. It's my the, the, the sun, I'm out here in the sun all day and it changes stations. I'm getting, like, glancing blows, so it'll get my skin a little color, probably. But I'm not going to get a sunburn or anything, I don't think. My legs are going to get it. My feet. Any part that I plan on exposing to the world is going to be exposed to the sun first, if I have any say in it. <laughs> I abhor the tanning bed. And you know what? I know why. I'm too socially anxious to ever go take off any of my clothes anywhere near a public place, especially where good-looking women work. I just, since I was a child, I just, it's not that, like, I'm scared that they'll think I'm ugly. It's just, like, I instinctually don't like taking, the last time I took down my pants in front of a woman, she sexually assaulted me. The last time I met a woman near me without taking down my pants, she sexually assaulted me. So you see, like, I just don't like being vulnerable around women in public. Even this, like, in places where you expect, like, at a massage or chiropractor that people will leave you alone not the case <laughs> apparently so i've learned you know male or female <laughs> it's hilarious oh oh my god it's so hilarious it's like isn't doesn't comedy come from pain you know i'd like to be a wartime comedian world war three is like hey hello everyone i know we've all lost loved ones to the advanced stages of Bio-warfare and cholera have been introduced to our water supply in some of these ravaging years. But isn't it great that we're still here to grieve the stricken and to go on and find that new world which mankind has always found, even after the worst of calamities have ran through your town like tanks over the bones of your ancestors? With magazines with proud white men sticking out their chests and shaking the hand of the enemy as they give them a, uh, the highest possible civilian medal of greatness for designing their, the engines in their tanks. <laughs> well, what do you say? Not laughing? Okay, let's try another one. What if Eva, Adolf Hitler and Eva Braun were actually, get this, Catherine Hepburn and Bing Crosby? <laughs> I don't know. What does that mean in the human mind? What does that mean in the human mind? What does that mean in the human mind? When actors are all the time. History has actors too. That's all part of the number two. Theaters for me and you. God's own language taking a poo. <laughs> I just made that up. You know, this is genius. I'm a genius. <laughs> Man, think about that. Hey, Dad, guess what? <laughs>
I find myself in the woods taking a shit, talking to people on YouTube, and the shirt off. I'm a genius, daddy. <laughs> Thanks, son. Good for you. <laughs> genius, you hear me? Genius! <laughs> Nobody believes me. I like to find some really retarded people and convince them I'm a genius. If you have two fingers and another two, that makes four. <laughs> and it all means death. Ooh, you're Jesus. I am. I am become death. The redeemer of worlds. You think I'm lying. But in fact, the world just stopped lying for a moment. I'm like the Jesus of not lying.